Praise the Lord, saints. We thank God for another opportunity, another time to come, especially this week of looking forward to Christmas and all. We thank Him that He is the Alpha and He is the Omega, first and the last, beginning and the end. Hallelujah. You are Alpha and Omega. We worship you, O Lord. You are worthy to be Another opportunity, God, to be thankful, to know that all of our help does come from you. We ask that as we celebrate this week, or this 25th of December, uh, the point in time of celebrating the birth of Christ, God, we, we thank you, God, that we can give reference point in time to knowing that these things took place in our lives. Lord, we pray that new births take place in the lives of those who perhaps don't even know it's coming their way. Lord, help them and hold them, God, that we not judge, but that we celebrate with them uh, a, a, a new beginning, a new change in their lives. Thank you, God, for the joy that the world didn't give and the world can't take away. We ask this in the blessed name of Jesus. Amen and amen. God bless you today. We thank God as we look and know that he is still on the throne. Amen. Now, today I want us to take a look at the gospel according to Mark. Amen. Mark chapter 2 and one particular verse. Move down to verse 19. And we'll go back, and I want you to go back and to read the rest of, of course, not all of chapter two um, in your time. Amen. We we uh, we are blessed to still be in the land of the living. Verse 19 says, And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them. They cannot fast. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing to his, his word today. I, I just want to talk about the, the joy that we have that, uh, that God has brought to us uh, through Christ Jesus. Amen. But before we look at this, this joy that God allows uh, through Jesus to be seen, let's, let's just go back a few pages here in uh, Mark, and kind of recap all of it that brings us up to verse uh, verse 19. Again, we, we say hello, good morning to Causey Chapel. Uh, 
we pray for your strength, those who are, are feeling feeble this morning, we pray that God would give you the energy and strength uh, to proclaim that he is Lord. Amen. Uh, Jesus starts this whole book, chapter out. He's preaching in the house. And then we find these four men. They brought one of the palsy, one who was on a bed that had no power to move. Somebody today might say that he had had a stroke. We don't know how how long he had been in this condition, but we do know that they brought him to Jesus. And uh, out of curiosity, I, I looked and saw and read and found that a stroke is caused by a blood clog that stops blood flow to the brain or by a blood vessel that ruptures to the brain. We do not know, thank God, how long he was in this condition, but we do know that these four men brought him to the right doctor. Oh yes, their faith brought him to Jesus. Their faith brought him, they had rooftop faith, amen. I know we have committees that we could have that commit stuff to, to, uh, to later on, but this was a, not a window committee, but this was a, a rooftop break open, uh, the shingles kind of committee that, that did this and they brought, their, they brought this man uh, to Jesus. I think that's what one thing that ought to be in our, our minds today as Christians, that we ought to be committed uh, to bringing others to Christ. Your faith can't save others, but you can uh, be, in, be committed enough to bring others to Jesus. Your testimony is good. Don't get me wrong. I keep on feeding the hungry. Keep on uh, blessing people with coats and uh, with boots and hats. Now, I tell you, that's good news. But the joy comes from the recipient's testimony that his or her own faith had made them whole. They believed in the Lord. Not my mother, not my father, but it's me, O oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Heal me, Lord, ought to be our prayer. We ought to have a receipt. Can I get somebody to testify and to say amen that, that you've got a receipt that shows that you've walked with the Lord. Uh, you've talked with him and, and you have joy with knowing that he is in your life. Well, Jesus is seen in verses 14, 15, really verse 16. He is seen eating at Levi's house. Or Matthew, for some of you who are Bible theologians, you know, and and he makes a great statement after they have made comment about him being down there. You know, people see you in certain places, they want to know why you're there. And the only reason that you're not talking about them there, because you didn't see them there. Can I get a witness here? Uh, but Jesus is seen uh, eating at Levi's house. And he made this awesome statement that says that, they that are whole don't need a doctor, but those who are sick, they're the ones who need the physician. He says, I came not to call the righteous, but I came to call sinners to repentance. Now, uh, when you have your Christmas party this week, uh, what will your gathering look like? Jesus gladly accepted the opportunity to meet with the outcasts, to meet with the sinners. Notice, he did not meet with them to condone their sin, but to turn them from their sins. They needed to experience the same kind of life-changing experience that happened to Matthew at his house. Secondly, uh, the outcasts and the sinners had needs as well. They were willing to confess their sins. Oh, yeah, they, 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 they were responsive to having their needs met. I tell you, the desperate tax collector, his life was changed when he met Jesus. Whether of them twain did the will of his father, 
They say unto him the first, and Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publican and the harlot go into the kingdom of God before you. Yes, the, the outcast had some needs, I tell you. The immoral man uh, had some needs. The sinner man has needs today. The thief, you heard Jesus say, Verily I say unto you, today you will be with me in paradise. Those who are rejected, they're all over the city, all over the land. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And when he found him, he said unto him, Do thou believe on the Son of God? I tell you, Jesus cannot help a person who is unwilling to confess his or her needs. The self-righteous, the self-sufficient, the self dependent feel that they they don't need any help those that feel that way and have beliefs of such a thing uh, are considered as fools well i tell you disease and accidents and uh, death confronts every one of us and when they do all of us refuse to confess their needs or our needs as we stand before the threshold of eternity, knowing that we are facing a, a dark hour or a dark point in time in our lives. Whosoever therefore confess before me, before men that I am God, will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my father which in heaven which is in heaven and i don't think any of us want to to really get to the point where we are denying god as a matter of fact once you accept him in your life there ought to be a point in time where that just becomes more motivated you ought to want to be more closer and closer to the to the master whosoever shall confess the lord jesus is the son of god god dwells in him and he in God. And then when we get down to verse number 16, the question says, why or how is it uh, that Jesus eats with them and not with us? Why is it that we find that uh, John's disciples and the Pharisees can come together and fast, but Jesus' disciples or not fasting with, with them. And Jesus responds to society's attitude toward the outcast and the sinner uh, is this, that we are different from them. And I, 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 I dare you to go look in the mirror or to pull out your old photo album and to see that the, the very people that you are now calling outcasts and, and sinners was you some years ago. Some not so long ago, but we find that here in verse uh, 16 of, of Mark chapter 2, it says that when the scribes and Pharisees saw that he ate with the publicans and the sinners, they said unto his disciples, how is it that he eateth and he drinketh? <laughs> with the publicans and the sinners. How, how could he be having figure pudding and eggnog <laughs> with those who are publicans and, and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, uh, they that are whole, am I talking to anybody today that's, that's been made whole? Uh, you, you don't need uh, to see the physician. There's no need for you uh, to put um, uh, a prescription in for for medicine for you with Dr. Jesus, Amen. He is in your presence. You are uh, in His. He said, "But I have come, and I came here uh, for the sinner uh, to repent." This time of year, I know some um, are sad because of the loss of loved ones during this time of year. Some. Uh, or, or sad and, and lonely, but let me encourage you to know uh, that you're not alone. Uh, where two or three uh, touch and agree is, is surely one scripture we 
we, we talk about, but I'm here to tell you that you're, you're never alone. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and they that dwell therein. That will be you. That includes you, uh, that he is with you uh, to the end. Amen. Through it all. Amen. The religious and uh, the respectable of society will hold contempt um, against the sinner. Why? Because he is below their standards and he's below their discipline. I, I tell you, you be, be, be careful. Um, uh, be careful. Everybody at uh, this time of year that you don't have uh, too much of the other spirit because people will begin to judge you and people will begin to have all sorts of manner of conversation about you, a, a man, and uh, rightfully so. I, I, I think that when the scripture declares uh, that we ought to be uh, transformed by the renewing of our minds, I think that, we, that that ought to really take a hold of our spiritual realms within us and not judge man, but that we might recognize the joy that comes from Christ dying for us or really being birthed for us as we look into this new year, this new uh, uh, or end of Christ, uh, December, as we look at Christmas being a time that we can identify with a newness, a belief change taking place, uh, that we're not so hard uh, on the outcast, that we're not so uh, so quick to judge the sinner man. I tell you, some men are more principled and more disciplined than others. Amen. There's just some people who are not like you. Amen. And, and, and thank God that, that God has been working on you to bring you to a point where you can identify that you are no longer what you used to be and, and, and are approaching and, uh, a point where you can become what God would have you to be. Amen. They had great opportunity. Uh, some had more training as children. You know, everybody did not come up with a mother and a father in the house. Uh, some uh, did not have the kinds of education or the opportunity uh, to visit different environments or, and have resources available before them. So their, uh, their, their present state of mind, their present state of being is different from you who had all those things. It must also be remembered that when dealing with others, we must know that we are dealing with different traits and different abilities different strengths and different weaknesses of men that are different because of their inheritance, because of their childhood opportunities. Oh, many of us, thank God, was, was birthed in hospitals. We're not born in a manger. Come on, help me somebody. We're not, we're not out in the field or, or born in the, in the back room by um, uh, 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 the handmaidens. Can I get a witness? This was an enormous uh, hope of every man. No matter how weak you are, no matter how undisciplined or, or unprincipled you are, there is hope for you in Christ Jesus. This man can, uh, can be now brought not only through the roof, but he can be born again. He can be recreated in Christ Jesus, made into a new individual, made into a new creation, having new birth. Happy birthday, Jesus. Having an opportunity because the Bible declares that Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, you know, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The religious, I tell you, questioned Jesus, questioned his association with the outcasts, questioned his association with the sinner. And Jesus' reply was a forceful one, that I came not to call the righteous, repent, but I come for sinners that they might repent. The second point that I feel is good. Is, is worth looking at is, is the concern that Jesus had for his own purpose as the Messiah. He said, I came not to call the righteous, 
but sinners to repent. Notice the righteous do not know that they need to repent. It says, for being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Be careful that you think, don't think more of yourself than you ought to. I need thee every hour, oh, most precious, oh precious God. And for we dare not make ourselves of the numbers, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves or comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Yes, I, I think birds of a feather do flock together. Amen. It's obvious. We don't see a whole bunch of or a, a collage of different kinds of birds flying uh, together. The, the hawks hang out with the hawks. Come on. Uh, the buzzards uh, hang out with the buzzards. Can I get a witness here? Oh, yes. And I, and I, I hear the disciples of John and, and the Pharisees coming together. It's an odd looking bunch. Hey, Amen. They, they, Pharisees ought to be with the Pharisees. <laughs> John's disciples ought to be with uh, with John, but unfortunately, they can't be with John at this appointed time. Why, Reverend, can't they hang out with the one who they are followers of? Well, because John is in jail. Amen. It just so happened that the religious uh, and all of them format, formats are placed before us. We hear that uh, the Pharisee, he fasted twice a week. And John's disciples are now in the midst of a Monday, Thursday group who will find themselves fasting because John is locked up. And, and, and it seems that the Messiah, Jesus, would be right there with them, um, uh, fasting with them. Oh, yes. How, how can it be that the one that John was talking about is not concerned enough to come together and to form a, an allegiance, an alliance that says that we're going to fast until something happens. The question of Jesus' messiahship lay at the root of the question. John's disciples are involved and, and the Pharisees are also involved and they're asking Jesus a question. What an unusual alliance to come together. But I tell you, Remember, John had preached against the Pharisees. John had preached against them as being hypocrites. Said that they were doomed. A horrible fate lied before them. And believers should not judge believers for not being religiously uh, uh, right. No, no. Censoring and, and condemning others are uncalled for. Religious rituals are not standard thing in the lives of the believers to cause one to judge another belief. But we find that Jesus, Jesus the Christ, ever present in the presence of those who need him the most, made a difference. Oh, what a joy in my life, Jesus on the inside, working on my outside. Verse 19 of chapter 2 of Mark says it this way. And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. As long as Jesus is present in your life, my brother and my sister, at this point in time, you ought to have some joy. Now, uh, joy and happiness is two different things. As we all know, we've, we've said it over a hundred times that happiness depends on happenings. And joy depends on what happened with him. Amen. This is the very reason Jesus did not teach his disciples to fast as a, as a religious ritual. He never taught us that we needed to fast. 
There's no need to fast when the presence and the joy of Jesus fills one's life. Jesus used a clear picture that teaches what his mission was all about. What Jesus was doing was just like a wedding. He said that I'm launching a new marriage of people to God. He said, I am the bride's groom. I'm the son of God himself, who is to wed the people of God. And, and my chosen disciples are the friends of the bride's groom. Say, a wedding is a joyful, not a sad occasion that requires fasting, but the presence of Christ, the presence of the groom brings about joy and not sadness. Let's celebrate, I tell you, the birth of Christ for, in essence, Mark is painting a picture. It says that the very presence of Jesus brings about joy. And whether you can uh, see the baby in the manger or see him uh, preaching and folk tearing the roof off to get to him, it ought to bring about some joy. The discovery of Christ and the day-to-day -day consciousness of his presence ought to bring joy to our lives. Christ is the secret to life. He is the secret and the joy in life. No matter how gloomy life may be, no matter how, uh, how we are having to stand in line to get vaccinated, vaccinated, how far people have gone to feel a certain way, Jesus the Christ can change one's life and bring joy to the heart. Let's celebrate today uh, the birth of one who is coming back again, not as a baby, but as a King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Enjoy your holiday, speak well, of one another, but let the word be known throughout all the ages. Go tell it on the mount that Jesus the Christ is born.